I remember back when I was a kid with the little G.I. Joe and the big wheel. My cousin Andre, big two-ton toast skin eater, had the audacity to sit his ass on my big wheel and broke it. He my age, but weighed the same as his daddy. The little wheel on my big wheel snapped. I was hurt because I just got it for my birthday. It was still brand new. Then he went and told his mama, my auntie, that I broke it. She went and told my mama. Then when I tried to tell him the truth, they laughed at me and told me to stop lying. Imagine not being old enough to know what a defense attorney was, but in desperate need of one. I was about seven, eight years old, and that right there hurt me to my core. Now, the reason my auntie and my Sasquatch cousin was even over in the first place is because my daddy got caught cheating on my mama. Back in them days, just about every dude was built like Nick Cannon and the baby. Them brothers was quick to pump, dump, and disco, you heard? Mama confronted my daddy, and that shit turned into a big ol' argument. My daddy never admitted to cheating, but his side chick messed around and left her wig and her ripped up pantyhose in the Cadillac. The wig was nasty too, looked like my daddy nutted in it. So when my mama found the evidence, all hell broke loose. My daddy played it cool, packed his clothes, walked out the house, hopped in his caddy and never came back. He ain't even say goodbye to me. Didn't even look at me when he drove off. The worst part was, he was the one dude who would've took up for me if I had told him that Andre had broke my damn big wheel. Now you wasn't there. I had to fend for self. Wasn't but a matter of days before my uncle swooped in and made his move on my mama. Talking about he gonna take care of her and treat her like a queen and all this Motown bullshit. Wish he'd have crooned his ass into the workforce. Before you know it, my uncle was moving into the house. I could hear him and my mama moaning in the middle of the night. My uncle's such a bitch, my mama moaning voice deeper than his. I'm like, what the fuck really going on? I felt the kind of way. Cause even though my daddy never thought twice about walking out on his family, it still hit like my uncle was betraying my father. And I ain't like that shit. But I'm eight years old. I can't process all the things that I'm feeling. Now my cousin Andre over at the crib all the time and he was always bullying me. That shit really got to me. Cause he could tell a lie better than I could tell the truth. So nothing I said really mattered. My mama was so preoccupied with my uncle that she kind of didn't notice that her first and only son was on a serious decline. Then her and my uncle had my little sister Sharia, and that was all she wrote. I was practically forgotten by my mom at that point. By the time I was 10 years old, I'd been in and out of juvenile court about six times. My first trip to juvie was when my uncle tried to booty snatch me in my sleep and I kicked him in his throat and the judge pressed charges on me. I think I told y'all this story already, but my mama believed his word over mine. I felt like a stranger in my own house. My uncle talking about he gonna straighten me up. Says the man who failed a field sobriety test after being pulled over for riding a quarter horse through Hollywood, Florida. He stalled me out real quick when I threatened to burn his novel collection when he wasn't home. But here go the crazy shit. My uncle ended up cheating on my mama too. He got busted, only difference was, unlike my daddy, my uncle stayed. He ain't had nowhere to go, cause he was an unemployed whole bum bastard living off my mama government aid. Me and my sister used to call him Mr. Mooch. My mama was hurt, but she ain't kick him out. I think my uncle was the closest my mama thought she'd ever get to my daddy again, so she just kept holding on. My daddy was her true love. Problem was, he battered her physically and emotionally. So any validation from my uncle was like a drug. Fast forward another eight years and my uncle tried to touch my little sister the same way he touched me. He let my little sister tell it, old boy tried to get his whole thumb off in there like he was the doctor for the gymnastics team. That was the last straw. My mama poured hot coffee on him while he was asleep. And to help him cool off, she poured a bedpan full of piss on him. She ran him off for good. I bumped into him a few years later and that urine smell really cooked in solid. He got what he deserved. And even still, I felt betrayed by my mama because when he tried to touch me, my mama stayed with him. Said I was lying. Made me feel like my asshole wasn't as important as my sister. For the next 12 to 13 years, I was in and out of the system. I'd always end up doing a longer bid than I was supposed to because I was always getting into conflicts with the other inmates. Back then, I could have wrote a whole op-ed on being a hothead because it was easy for me to lose control like four Negroes in a bobsled, you heard? By the way, it's a like button down here somewhere. He be talking about your mama. Go on and stomp him out. Hit him. Let me tell y'all something about that joint. 
Don't do shit in there but lie on each other and lie on each other. Negro lie on me though, he get his arm broke, you hurt? I spent six months plotting on his ass, but when I got him, I got him good. One dude in the joint lied on me, said I got the germ. I beat his teeth out when he was asleep. It's not as brutal as it sounds, he only had four of them anyway. But a couple of them went down his windpipe and he choked. By the time the medics got him, he was limp. That shit caught me a whole new case, but I had no tolerance for liars, and he ended up being the prison fluffer. If I added it up over the years, I had spent an extra six and a half years in the joint for so-called defending my honor. Instead, I could have spent that time getting a degree with honors. One time I finally got out, I ended up dating my PO. I know what you're thinking. That shit got to be against the rules, and it was, but she was good for me. Kept me on the straight and narrow. She improved the quality of my life. Had me planning for my future. Pussy always smelled good. She even looked cute around the house. Most of the gals I dated up until that point looked like leprechauns until it was time to dress up and go out. But here's what happened. She was real family oriented and sometimes she would go off to see her folks in California and I would flip out. Cause it came off to me like she was trying to break up with a nigga. How you gonna tell me, all right, then I love you. I call you as soon as I get off the plane and don't expect me to be paranoid. That in itself sounds like a lie. I get panic attacks and pick fights with her. Called her all out of name. I even accused her of cheating. One time I pulled up on her ass with the machete and scared her pop so bad he had a mild heart attack. She had all her clothes unpacked hanging in her mother's closet. I knew something was up. I figured she wasn't coming back. So I lit the closet on fire. I ended up back in the joint and she got suspended without pay. It was a bad look cause I was still on parole and way outside my jurisdiction. Folks in the joint start calling me kamikaze. Say I like to crash and burn. She ain't talked to me for years and my life took a downward spiral. Then every gal I dated after that would start off cool in the beginning and then end up being so dependent on a I get so resentful, I just branded myself Captain Saver Thought. I dated one gal, she had a daughter who was more mature, more dependable, and more responsible than she was. Ask me how old her daughter was. 14 years old. In fact, the daughter was more like the parent. Used to help me organize the bills and schedule a mama's pop smears. And she was dating a dude who was like 15 years old and just as worthless as a mama. Better the devil you know. So one day they told me I had to pick her up from school which I did. So I went and scooped her up. She said she wanted to go get some coffee. So we went to a little coffee shop. Next thing you know, me and this little 14 year old gal get to chopping it up. Things got a little personal. So I asked her, I said, hey, why are you dating that loser when you so smart? She said, probably the same reason you dating my mama. I said, what? She said, let's be real. The only reason a man in his right mind would date my mom is because one, he feels inferior to more responsible good women and doesn't want to deal with that level of accountability. Two, he has abandonment issues and feels more comfortable being surrounded by people who are dependent and less likely to bail on him rather than being around people who would lift him up. Or three, he's been so traumatized at a young age, he's emotionally still a teenager. That shit cut me. I said, well, fuck you, because first off, you don't know nothing about me. And in case you didn't know, your mama fucked your boyfriend. I got a good, but she ain't even blink like when you pull a prank on Stevie Wonder. You know what she told me? I'm sorry I triggered you, Mr. Jackson. I said, little girl, you ain't gonna shoot nobody. She smiled and said, no, I mean, I'm sorry I triggered you emotionally. Hey, can I be zen for a minute? Zen, it means zero ego negro. Bars. This little 14 year old gal had me so worked up I was shaking. Little did she know I had my switchblade open beneath the table we were sitting at. But she did not snap back when I tried to hurt her feelings. She just became kinder. She talked softer. She seemed unfazed, too comfortable, like Nick Cannon watching an episode of The Handmaid's Tale. She said it was obvious that her explanation for why someone would date her mother seriously triggered me. Then she gathered her things and called an Uber. There was this awkward silence between us while she sat there waiting on her car. I felt guilty. I said, hey, you ain't got to wait for no Uber. I give you a ride home. She said, oh, I didn't order no Uber. I texted my daddy. He at the house and he just finished fucking my mama. He be here any minute. The hair on the back of my neck stood up and right then her daddy pulled up. I hopped in my Volvo and took a shortcut. I got to her mama house before them. I damn near kicked down the door like batter ram in the hood. Her mama answered, I tried to play it cool. I said, what you been doing? Her mama said nothing. I said, you fucking your baby daddy? She said, what? I said, I know he was over here. She said, over here when? I said, your daughter just told me he was over here blowing your back out. She said, who? I said, don't play stupid. 
She said, my ex is in prison. Right then, her daughter pulled up with her daddy. I said, he looked freer than Kyle Rittenhouse to me. She said, that's not her daddy, that's my brother. Her daughter strolled up laughing and said, I knew that would trigger you. She played me harder than a Fortnite avatar. Then her daughter strolled into the house and they invited me in. I didn't budge. I knew right then I'd fucked up. I realized at that moment what her daughter was saying all along was true. My daddy cheating and leaving the house the way he did made me feel a kind of way as a kid. Truth be told, I was still feeling a kind of way as an adult. The thought of being cheated on and abandoned was as intense on that day as it was on the day my daddy walked out the house and never came back. So there I stood, wearing my embarrassment like a Gucci jacket looking all soft and puffy as fuck for no reason. I realized the reason I'd wasted all them years in the joint for so-called defending my honor was because the feeling of people lying on me the way my cousin Andre and my uncle did made me feel the same way I felt when I was a kid, thinking nobody would believe me. So every time I got lied on, I got triggered and went to extreme lengths to make us <laughs> pay. I would never even bother with trying to explain my side of the story to authorities because I was programmed by my upbringing to think nobody would believe me anyway. So rather than talking it out, I just snatch a bottom lip off his face and punch his teeth out. Bite his nipple off, reach up under and pull out one of his ribs. Boom! Solitary confinement. Five more months in the joint. Next lie. Elbow to the eye socket. Backhand knuckles to the temple and bite down on his uni brow. Bam! Another 18 months added to my sentence. I would just get triggered like a Karen observing a free black man frolicking about in a public park. So here I am in the doorway. My gal and her brother stood there looking at me as this reality hit me. My body starts shaking. She said, you sure you don't want to come inside? Her brother said, I think that need a hug. It was true. I grew up in a household that made me feel unworthy. I felt like a loser in everybody's eyes. So I behaved like a loser. I was losing at the game of life because I was a slave to my emotional triggers. I was such an emotional slave that even a 14 year old gal knew how to trigger me. You ever hear people say so-and-so know how to push your buttons? What that means is so-and-so know how to trigger you emotionally. They understand your emotional trauma and how to use it to get you to react irrationally. Ever notice the folks who really know how to push your buttons be the same folks who installed them? Her brother tried to hug me. My reflex was to judo throw old boy. Can't handle no man putting his hands on me. But I realized I was feeling that way because I was being triggered by the thought of my uncle trying to thumb fuck me and my little sister. Right then, I pushed down that fear, let old boy give me that hug, and the tears came streaming down my face. It was an emotional money shot. I said, fuck it, and passed some gas, too. I apologized to my gal, thanked her and her brother for not calling the police. And even still, part of me wanted to get revenge on their asses for making me feel a kind of way. Another part of me knew I had to thank them for opening my eyes to what's been holding me back all my life. Her daughter showed up in the doorway holding a cake. She said, well, since you ain't coming in, we bringing the party outside. And in a split second, some of my homies from inside the joint popped up in the background and yelled, surprise. I jumped back and reached for my cutter and then realized it was my fucking birthday. All the homies I did time with over the years was there. Damn near 35 years to this day, my daddy got caught cheating on my mama. 35 years ago to this day, I became invisible. And here I am. 35 years to the day being celebrated. Fuck y'all, OG's cry too. <laughs> Crazy thing is, had I known they was all trying to celebrate my birthday, I'd have never showed up. Cause I ain't believe I was worthy of celebration. But her daughter knew exactly how to get me over there. I had a blast seeing all the homies too, never realized how wholesome they look when they ain't wearing orange. From that birthday to this very day, I've devoted my life to freeing myself of emotional triggers. I've spent the last 15 years of my life learning how to stop my emotional triggers from sabotaging my potential. When we try to get even, we get even worse balls. And that's what this channel is all about. That's what we discuss in my course modules. The emotional triggers that cause you to underestimate your own value and behave in ways that compromise your ability to grow past your glass ceilings and optimize your network and your network balls. If you ain't hit the subscribe button by now, you must be watching this shit on a Jumbotron. Please visit my YouTube channel and be sure to subscribe.